Hi, I'm Phnom, a Beat the Often Path by uh, turning science fiction into reality for a better future. Phnom Bagley designs the future of everything on and off planet Earth. She co-founded Nonfiction, a design firm that turns science fiction into reality for a better future. She's a TED speaker who has designed new food systems for astronauts and who really sees the bigger picture in everything that she does. I'm not going to lie to you, her company closely parallels the vision that I have for myself, for my own future, and for my own company. So it's been deeply fascinating talking with someone who has truly shaped an unusual life of exceptional meaning. Joining us now is Phnom Bagley. I'm Ross Palmer, and this is Beat the Often Path. All right, welcome to the show, Phnom. It's so great to have you here. You have built what appears to be from the outside a dream life, doing some incredibly weird and futuristic things. So talk to me a little bit about what you're doing and how you ended up here, because it's quite bizarre. Yes. Um, so I'm based in San Francisco today, but I originate from uh, Paris, France. And uh, throughout my life, uh, I've always loved the infinitely small and infinitely big and the um, you know things that seem to be unattainable, and I wanted to attain them. And so uh, with the inspiration from science fiction and movies and literature, I was able to really practice uh, an expansion of my imagination. And so I wanted to find a career that allowed me to do that and get paid for it. And so through many trials and tribulations, I ended up starting my own design firm called Nonfiction in 2016 with my partner, Martis Bagley. And what the premise of the company is, is that we take science fiction and then we make it real. And uh, we do that for I the benefit that. of humans and, and the planet. And uh, we practice in different ways. So we design a lot of physical products, uh, practicing what's called industrial design, which is the design of mass manufactured products specifically. And I'm also a space architect. So that is someone who designs how astronauts live and work up in space, whether it's in microgravity uh, around the Earth or on the surface of the moon or Mars. And so that kind of like mental trip between uh, what's going on on Earth and what's going on in space and back and forth is really at the root of what they do every day. I mean, how cool is that for the people listening? That's just awesome. It sounds, and you said in your TED Talk that, yes, it's a real job, which I still can't believe, honestly. And I think a lot of people might have their doubts as well. Yes, it's a real job somehow. But your TED Talk is quite nice because you talk about the food that astronauts eat and a lot of these aspects of making that journey more livable and more enjoyable. People have this vague recollection of these 1960s era astronaut food, like tang and freeze-dried ice cream and all of those things. And you're saying, what if we reimagine that and built a, a device that you can actually grow plants, you can have kale, you can have certain types of plants that grow, not only for better quality food and produce for the astronauts as they travel, but also to give them the peace of mind and that connection to something organic when they're surrounded by buttons and wires and things that are whirring and beeping in a very cold climate. So that, to me, seemed just like a really awesome endeavor. How did you get in a position where you were able to propose or build or conceive of something like that that's so complicated? By the way, this is the best recap of the project I've ever heard. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> yes. So it all, <laughs> it all started as a competition put together by uh, NASA, the Canadian Space Agency, and Methuselah Foundation, which is a foundation that focuses on longevity. And so the premise of the competition was how do we feed uh, astronauts going to, to, to deep space missions, which means really long-term missions like going to Mars. And so we started researching, you know, what were they, the biggest challenge to even go to Mars and, you know, the rocketry and, um, you know, how do we design uh, space modules is going to be figured out eventually, but but it seems that food is one of those problems we don't have a solution for quite yet. Because what's common for astronauts to eat right now is uh, freeze-dried food or ready-to-eat food. And a lot of these are, um, you know, have an expiration date of uh, about two years. And going to Mars and back is going to take between two and, a three, two and a half and three years. So it doesn't work. So instead of just thinking about the reconstruction of micronutrients, like what you described um, was, was done in the 1960s, what we wanted to do was, was offer 
these astronaut real food, real macronutrients, um, food that they can relate to emotionally, feed, uh, food that really feed their souls and uh, reintegrate rituals and culture into their life as they're putting their lives on the line, right? Here, we're asking these astronauts to, to, to go on an extremely dangerous uh, mission uh, to be exposed to uh, levels of radiation that no humans have ever experienced before, uh, isolation, being away from family and friends, uh, all of that is a lot. So whatever comfort we could give them from an experiential standpoint is what we wanted to bring into, into that project. How have you been able to focus on larger problems in general? Because on your website, you focus on quite a large range of different types of forward-thinking projects. How have you been able to do that and get paid for it in a world where this job doesn't exist? You can't just apply for this job, generally speaking. That's right. I had to invent it. And it all started about five years ago when I went on one of these personal and professional development workshops called Hive. Uh, in uh, in California, and uh, one of the exercises we had to go through was, what is your life purpose? And I and I remember at that moment I never really asked myself that because I was so interested in every single subject. I was interested in physics, in biology, in design, in architecture, in in you know policy and all that all of that. But I really had a hard time making a mark in the world because people were very confused about what it was about. Mm -hmm. And That's so my life. Yep. the right um, and so the first year I went through that workshop I actually did not find my life purpose. I went through the exercise and I went through all the uh, you know uh, uncomfortable part of the exercise trying to break down what I loved and uh, what what will need uh, needed and things like that but but I still couldn't put it in one sentence. So what I did is that I came back the next year and reconnected with all these people again. And then I found it. I found the phrase, turning science fiction into reality for a better future. What this sentence means to me is that it is all encompassing, but also it's very aspirational, right? I look to the future uh, through the lens of utopia, um, which might sound a little naive, you know, when, yeah, uh, but, but I think that a uh, hopeless sense of hope that I have about the future and the fact that I can have a say in it is the driver of all things. And then from there, we started attracting as a company all of these incredible companies that actually do that. Right? They turn science fiction to reality to make the world a better place. That's so cool. I mean, you described my perfect vision, and that's why I'm so excited to talk to you, because I run a marketing agency, and I have done digital marketing for a very long time. But of course, my dream is to only have clients in these fields. And I've done this podcast, I've talked to enough phenomenal individuals at this point, that you have this sense of something out there that's greater, that's possible. You see smart people working on smart things that are also grounded in the realities of our planet. That's where I want to live. So when I look at you and your work, it seems like uh, something that I would strive to be in, let's say, three to five years from now, where all of my clients are doing those things. And, and I've found it to be very difficult, to be very honest with you in the beginning, because you're just trying to get business at first. And so you have to be a little less picky about the kind of business that you take on. But I would love it if every single client, every single project that I worked on was in alignment with that greater sense because I think I share the exact same value system that you do and that's what I want too. So how do you think that I or people like me, how can I move more towards only getting the kind of clients that I want and sustaining my business with better projects that are more exciting? Like yourself and everybody you 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 just mentioned, um, when I started my company, we were in that situation too. We had to say yes to a lot of projects that were not that interesting, right? Designing computers or, or speakers or things like that. I've done that for many mm -hmm. years before. And so that actually gave us a leg up to create a sense of ease in attracting what we actually wanted. And then that episode of finding my life purpose was actually the shift. It was it was what happened to the the, the ma major shift that completely changed how people perceived us, and also um, and how we kind of redefined it ourselves. That makes sense. So when you structure this, you take on clients. Um, when you have 
this kind of big thinking world that you're living in? How do you make sure that they're on board? Because I assume a large part of what you have to do is thinking and just conceptualizing, because especially if you're building something that was never built before. So how do you structure that or explain that to your clients in such a way that they understand and they give you that freedom that you can play with ideas versus, you know, we need something in three days and it has to be like this. How do you expand their thinking when they hire you? So it all starts with what we call a um, um, introductory workshop. And so during that workshop, we kind of define who are you as a company? Who are you as a founder? Why did you start this company? Really like digging deep into all of these essential questions. Because some people forget, right? Sometimes they're like knee deep into, into a problem or in a, in a round of funding and, and they forget why they start all of this. So we, we redefine that. And then we go through uh, what we call the six questions. Uh, these are six essential questions that uh, validate whether a project should exist or not. Um, and so that's an exercise we go through with our with our, uh, our clients, every single one of them, small, big, everything in between. And so the six questions are the following. Why should this exist? Uh, what are we saying with this product or this solution? Uh, when is it going to become real? Um, uh, what is it? Uh, Sorry, how, how do we make it real? When is it going to make an impact? And uh, who is it serving? Um, I think that's that's all of them. Um, so anyway, so so we go through this exercise and have multiple members of the client size and multiple members of our creative team uh, answering these questions, you know, and, and really having our brain travel from the perspective of the user, from the perspective of the market, from the perspective of, of perhaps the earth, and, and understand what is the implication of this product existing in the world in the future. And then from there, we, um, we, we kind of like break down where are we going, right? And then we can, be, we can get a sense of how outrageous the client is willing to go, right? And then we will go very far. And then some clients are very... Uh, cautious, especially people who work in uh, first responder, uh, the, like first responders, like firefighters, police officers that we work with. You know, it's a little bit um, of, a, of, a, of, of crafting the story in a way that doesn't push them off that we have to do uh, during the exercise. So, so we craft all of that. And at the end of that introductory workshop, we have a good idea of what we should do, how far we can go and where we should start. And so, so that's that's actually been a, one of the most effective exercises that we do. That's very cool. So, what if somebody comes back to you and they say, "You say, why should this exist?" And they say, "To make me as much money as possible. When should it exist? Now. Who is it serving me, the CEO, to make me rich?" <laughs> like, a lot of people are in business not for altruistic reasons. Um, how do you find those types of entrepreneurs that are motivated by, or business owners that are motivated by some of these grander ideals than just maximizing shareholder value in the short term or just making as much money as possible in the short term? Yeah. Well, the thing about making as much money as possible is that we shouldn't like shun that either. I mean, of course, uh, otherwise they wouldn't start a company. Right. Um, but at the same time, um, so the people who describe themselves as, as what you just said, they can't work with us. We actually have conditions to work with us now. Uh, condition number one, it has to be a first to market innovation or product. Uh, so everybody who wants to do a Me Too product or, you know, uh, go after a market that uh, already exists, um, we're not interested. Condition number two is that it has to serve at least one of the 17 um, uh, sustainable development goals. Put together I saw by that. That's my favorite part. So awesome. Yeah. I love so, that. So, so th this list is, you know, uh, encompasses poverty and access to healthcare and education and, and sustainable systems for, for cities and water and things like that. So if you, and we're, not, we're in, a, in a day and age where if you don't satisfy at least one of these, like you shouldn't be in business. Uh, that's mm -hmm. that's just mm -hmm. the way I think about things. And then the Completely third agree. reason, uh, the, third, the third condition to work with us is um, it has the project has to have a path to execution and success. So execution and success when you handle hardware or architecture like we do, you have to have money. Right? You have to have the team, you have to have the vision, you have to have all these things. So when we have teams that come to us with a fleeting idea 
or, oh, I, I just thought of this last night and thought I would contact you. They can't work with us either mm. because we need people who are deeply, deeply passionate about what they're embarking on. Because typically these projects are so big that you will dedicate five to 10 years of your life to that minimum. So we need to make sure that these people have that intention. That's such a great philosophy. Um, well, I, I'm very grateful for your time. I do look at you as an inspirational figure in my own life. I strive to achieve some of the things that you have. Um, you are a great model for me of building a company in a better way, in a conscious way, being successful according to the metrics of the outside, but still having a set of values that you adhere to and only taking on those kind of projects. So I will definitely be using you and your work and your company as a personal inspiration for me for the next several years. So thank you for providing that. I really do appreciate it. And I'm a big admirer of the way that you look at the world and, and the way that you have shaped your life. I think it's incredible. And I think that I'm not the only one who will think that it's incredible the more they get to know you. So I appreciate you. Well, thank you, Russ, for having me. It's been a, a real pleasure to to have this conversation and really thinking, right? I, I felt like I was, tra I said that earlier, I felt like I was traveling during this this, uh, this nice. conversation, um, you know, in space and time. And and that's the magic of science fiction. And that's why we look up to it. And that's why I and hopefully more people look to the future with bright eyes. And I want more people to see it that way. I couldn't agree more. And where can people see all of the breadth of work that you have done? Because again, it will make anybody think I'm sure of it. Uh, sure. Um, um, I'm pretty you know, active on, on LinkedIn and on Twitter. So you can find me there, first name, last name. Uh, we have a website uh, that is actually being redesigned right now because uh, Ooh, all the projects exciting. that we have on our website is actually quite quite old, so we need to update okay. all of that. But uh, one of the uh, most exciting things that we've built over the years is a library of videos that explains how me and my partner think about design and the future of everything. And so that's called Future Future, and that Amazing. can be found on uh, YouTube. If you type in nonfiction design, you'll find it. Nonfiction design, great stuff, food for thought. Phenom, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, and with that, the official podcast is over. 